Hello everyone, this is Suzanne at The Gospel Truth. I'm sorry it's been five days. It's been a rough five days. I have been experiencing a lot of pain in my legs and my knees. I've been trying to walk every day, but that increases my pain. And then of course, trying to keep the dog occupied. But mostly, um, I don't get up till 11 o'clock easy. And it's quite a chore just getting up sometimes. But I'm back and I go see my surgeon tomorrow <clears throat> about my knees and see what the plan is and if we can come up with a solution to help calm down this pain. I'm hoping there's a way we can do that because I'm just not quite ready for another major surgery. All right, let's get going again. And I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your understanding. It means a lot to me. All right. A lot of you have hung in with me, and I'm just so glad that you did and, and that we are a group of people that understand life and things come up and things happen that are out of our control, and we can be patient and kind and encouraging to one another. Please leave your comments below. I see a lot of you are viewing. If you could at least press that like button for me, I sure would appreciate it. Kind of like to know you're out there and uh, introduce yourself. That would be awesome. Kind of like to see who's viewing and uh, learn your name and a little something about you. All right. We just finished up with Destroy Your Encouragement. And today we're going to um, learn how to recognizing our discouragement. Again, this is the book, Keep the Faith, How to Stand Strong in a World Turned Upside Down by Dr. David Jeremiah. All right, without any further ado, let's get started. Recognizing discouragement. Recognizing what makes us vulnerable to discouragement is the first step to keeping it at a distance. There are four factors that can lead us to losing heart. Factor one. Fatigue. Vince Lombardi observed that fatigue makes cowards of us all. The wall builders found that to be true. The strength of the laborers is failing, said Judah, Nehemiah 4.10. The construction pr project required 52 days of back-breaking labor. Halfway finished, the workers had been going at it for a month. Fatigue was catching up with them, and when energy runs short, so does courage. Haven't you found this to be true? You're working 12-hour days, finishing the annual report, you're working on weekends, or you're cleaning the house all day, then helping the kids with algebra homework at night. For a while, you'll rock along, doing what you feel you must. But sooner or later, your personal limits will catch up with you. Every human body is governed by its own mathematical formula involving time, pressure, and exertion. If you exceed the limits of that equation, the cracks start to appear. You begin to be tense, irritable, and gloomy. There are times when your enemy, the devil, circles your name on his agenda. As I become older, I hope I've grown wiser. One little bit of wisdom I've grasped is that I can no longer push myself as hard as I used to. I'm an odd one to be lecturing to you on this topic, for I've always been a type A personality. I doubt that will change. But these days, I see the importance of pacing myself. I need to build a little more margin in my life, and I need to protect those margins. Otherwise, if I push too hard for too long, I'm going to see diminishing returns on the investment of my time and talents. And then comes the deluge of discouragement. That certainly happened in Jerusalem. The people were weary, discouraged, and one other thing, they were frustrated. Wow. Can I relate to a several things in this? I have been fatigued. I've been irritable. I've been frustrated. Dealing with chronic pain issues is not an easy route to have to go in life. I know there are many more that are suffering greater, way greater than I am, and my heart goes out to you. But like someone once told me, 
Pain is pain. And for each person, it's different. Maybe what you're facing, I would crumble under. Maybe what I'm facing, you would crumble under. There are many different things that bring us down, that bring us to this point of fatigue. And we really do need to pace ourselves. Like it said here, have those margins. Have those margins. Okay, factor two, frustration. We've just seen Judah's complaint in the first part of verse 10 when he observed that the worker's strength was failing. He continued, there's so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. Can you imagine going to a huge, huge garbage dump? Mountains and mountains and mountains of garbage. And you have to clean all that up before you could even start to build. It would seem almost like an impossible task. Have you ever worked for days and weeks on mundane details, then stepped back and wondered if your efforts have any significance? Tired as they were, the Israelites no longer saw the proud, gleaming wall of their dreams. Visions of glory seemed like a mirage in the desert. There was nothing but broken bricks, mud, and debris. The 10th verse records that they were suddenly frustrated with the ever-present rubbish and rubble of heavy construction. Have you ever noticed how ugly a building site can be? Have you ever noticed how ugly a building site can be? I have. There would be a sign with the beautiful painting of a glass tower sparkling in the sunshine, and behind the sign is an ugly hole in the mud. At Jerusalem, the old walls had been torched. Now there were great piles of worthless debris everywhere. The frustration of those endless mountains of rubble was weighing on Nehemiah's people. They would nearly collapse in weariness as the sun went down. Then, arriving for work the next morning, it would appear to them as if nothing had been accomplished. It seemed as if the debris had a life of its own and was multiplying. They were burned out. Have you ever felt that way about laundry sometimes? <laughs> Especially when you were raising your family. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't go away. There's a buzzword for our times, burnout. We all use it. In past generations, a man might work his entire life at one trade for one employer, then retire after 50 years with the gold watch. If he ever felt burned out along the way, there wasn't the word to articulate it. Today, we are always shifting careers and pointing to burnout. I've heard it said, there are three ways to live. You can live out, you can wear out, or you can burn out. I'm hoping to live out, and I'm sure you'll agree that's the best alternative. I know that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to live out. I'm trying to still, you know, take the dog for walks every day, take care of my husband, clean the house, uh, make sure Sam gets his playtime with other dogs, visiting with my daughter. I want to live out my life. I don't want to wear out and I don't want to burn out. But again, those margins, right? I don't want to get too fatigued. So there's a the balance there too. But we need to define this concept of burnout with care. I hear people use the word to mean working too hard. That's not a definition of burnout. Many of my friends work hard and energetically without ever burning out because they work with focus and perspective. They have something called vision and they move forward toward obtainable goals. The true nature of burnout is working too hard at the wrong thing. It's striving for a goal you can't accomplish. Perhaps a goal no one can accomplish. Burnout is pulling the whole weight uphill all by yourself, reaching the summit and realizing you're only going to topple to the bottom to start all over again. It's a feeling of despondency, and Nehemiah's workers were suffering from rubbish burnout. They couldn't see the picture of the shining city, only the debris. In a word, they were frustrated. Factor three, failure. Nehemiah 4.10 tells us so much. The strength of the laborers is failing, fatigue. And there's so much rubbish, frustration, that we are not able to build the wall. Failure. A lot wrapped up in that, isn't it? I like how he can pick out 
The strength of the laborers is failing. It's fatigue. There's so much rubbish, frustration. And then we're not able to stand to build the wall. Failure. The Israelites threw up their hands here and pronounced their failure. Fatigue and frustration are a good recipe for failure. We're tired, they said. We're fed up. We can't do this. It was a great idea, but we've been at it for a month and we can't take it anymore. Negative talk was infectious, spreading like a virus to an infected community. Importantly, Nehemiah's people hadn't failed at all, but it appeared that way to them. Failure is one of life's giants, so let's look at it as a force for discouragement. Failure is universal. Every human being who has ever lived, with one exception 2,000 years ago, has succumbed to failure. What makes a difference is how we handle our failure. The great danger is letting our negative thoughts and impressions be compounded by the adversity we suffer. When things go wrong, we're more willing to give an ear to the enemy. The world's greatest de most motivational speaker and we slowly but surely begin to buy into his lies and distortions. I haven't accomplished anything at all, we murmur. I'm a failure. It's a sad place to be in your mind, isn't it? Factor four, fear. Read the words of Nehemiah 4, 11 through 12. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause their work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. We explored this topic of fear in the first chapter, but fear has something to do with discouragement too. Imagine the weary workers in Jerusalem building their walls in the midst of the ugly rubble. The job was grueling enough, but there was also the matter of these neighbors stopping by to put a word in their ear. These visitors were saying, We've got a few surprises in store for you. You won't know when, you won't know how, but just when you least expect it, we'll slip in and kill you. And we'll take you out by increments, one by one, until the walls stand half built and no one is left to complete them. Nothing derails the work of God's people like a negative word. Everyone who tries to serve the Lord knows the truth of this. I receive my fair share of critical letters. Someone hears me on the radio or someone sees something we've published and they attack. It goes with the territory of having a large ministry. But it's interesting to, to me to know how the enemy always knows just when to put one of those letters on my desk. They come in times of struggle. They come at the in-between moment, for when we're just about to regain our focus and move forward for God's kingdom again. That's when the venomous words always materialize from some quarter. We're tempted to say, so that's how people feel? Well, maybe I ought to just turn in my Bible and quit. Criticism is toxic. Perhaps you're coping with it right now. Perhaps the bitter words of others are eroding your spirit in the workplace or even your home. Perhaps there are people who play on your fears until you become very discouraged. Wow. You know, we see things going on in the world. Uh, one of the freshest things is the Olympic opening of the Olympics disgrace. I'm sure you've heard about it read about it, maybe even watched it. I did not watch it. I heard about it. I have no desire to watch it. I don't have no desire to watch it on YouTube or anything else. It's disgusting. That could cause a lot of people to just throw it in and say, we're up against too great an enemy. Why bother anymore? Evilness is overtaking, overtaking us, and we just should go with it. That's the attitude Satan wants us to have. Satan wants to discourage us. He wants to put fear in us, discouragement. Um, he wants us to become tired and frustrated. He don't want us to deal with it and cope with it. But we do. And how do we do that? Well, next time we come on, 
this hopefully is tomorrow. Responding to discouragement. And we're going to read uh, a second response. Continue the work God has given you. And carry someone else's burden. So we're going to respond to these different things. And we've identified them. And as always, the Bible is our best weapon against these things. The Bible is so full of encouragement. Seek out someone you admire that's a mentor to you, that can point out some scriptures to you to help you along the way, that can come alongside you. Wonderful YouTube videos out there. Um, just go on YouTube and type in how do I deal with discouragement or fear? I know I get a lot of um, things pop up that I, I listen to. And they inspire me. They encourage me. They help me keep strong in the Lord. And reading books such as this, reading devotional books, reading the Bible, number one. we got to be careful because sometimes we can get so caught up in these, these, these books and these little daily bread and turning point and we forget to pick up our Bible and continue reading the stories over and over again. I'm guilty. I'm guilty sometimes. I need to get into the word more. I think we can all say that, right? Let's be honest here. Sometimes it's easier to, oh, I'll just listen to a YouTube video, somebody that I really like, a great speaker, and that's my Bible study for today. What did the Bereans do? They searched the scriptures daily to see if things were so that were going on around them. And that's what we need to do. We really need to get back to the Bible first. And um, after we get done with this book, I got this book here, and I was browsing through it. It's very interesting. Manners and Customs in the Bible. And I want to read a little bit on the back here to you give you a foretaste of things to come. How did the exile change Israel's life? Why would Lot even think of throwing his daughters to a mob? What exactly were the differences between the Herodians, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes? Lots of questions crop up when you read the Bible. For answers, you need insight into the Bible cultures, Bible's culture, its people and how they lived. Manners and Customs in the Bible by Victor H. Matthews opens up the biblical word from the patriarchs to Roman Palestine. Period by period, you will learn how people built cities and families, what they put on for war and for pleasure, how justice was administered and religion practiced, what people ate and how they conducted trade. It's a wealth of insight gathered from the biblical text and from important extra-biblical sources, as well as from the most recent architecture archaeology findings, all backed with plenty of maps and illustrations. I think this is going to be great. And this is a revised edition. Let me see, when was this? Um, this was written in 1988, 1991 revision. And this says, um, what was behind Abraham's pretending that Sarah was his sister? Why was Lot willing to sell his daughters out to the men of Sodom rather than the strangers in his home? What political changes did Israel experience during the monarchy period? Um, each chapter furnishes an introduction to the political and physical setting of the period in Israel's history and outlines the basic structure of its social world. Oh, isn't that going to be great? I think we can learn a lot how people lived in, during their times. Certainly far, far different from how we live today. And maybe that will give us a deeper insight in, into the people of their time. How they lived, talked, ate, all that stuff. All right, everyone. You have a blessed day in the Lord. I have physical therapy at 1.30. It's almost 12.30 now. I'm going to have to play with Sam. He's getting quite mischievous this morning. He wasn't able to play with other dogs yesterday, and I'm not sure if they're going to be out today. 
But um, he already dragged one of my yarn balls out. <laughs> but he was all happy about it. Me, not so much. All right, you take care. Lord willing, I'll be back tomorrow, and we'll continue on with our studies. Take care. Bye-bye.